News of the Times. Wicked Wednesdays. Murder by Starvation. Welcome to News of the Times. In this episode, we look at some of the murder cases involving the purposeful starvation of the victim. This slow and torturous method of murder was more prevalent than one would like to think. The problem with poison was its discovery through testing. Battering, beating or shooting the partner could lead to a murder conviction. The slow method of starvation of the intended victim, if caught, tended towards a conviction of manslaughter over death by execution. We take a look at some of the cases that made the papers of starving a spouse to death in today's episode of Wicked Wednesdays. We hope you enjoy the show. We start this episode with the famous Penge case of the purposeful starvation of Harriet, a wealthy spinster heiress who was taken in by a calculating younger fortune hunter, Louis Staunton. Harriet's mother, spotting the type of character pursuing her vulnerable daughter, attempts to block the marriage, but fails. Once Louis and Harriet are married, Louis blocks contact with Harriet's mother and moves them both into a remote farmhouse near his brother. Setting the Scene Harriet Staunton was described as simple-minded and was privy to the considerable sum of £9,000, worth approximately £1,342,000 today. She fell under the sway of Louis Staunton, a one-time farmer who had moved up to the position of an auctioneer clerk. Louis was ten years younger than Harriet and was probably looked at as a lifeline to potential spinsterhood by her. Louis came into contact with Harriet through his sweetheart, 15-year-old Alice Rhodes. Alice's mother had remarried a cousin of Harriet's. Louis met her at Alice's home. Louis began his courtship of the vulnerable Harriet in earnest, although he was continuing his relationship with 15-year-old Alice. The death of Harriet Staunton. The case begins in the papers with this announcement. From the Manchester Evening News, 20th of April, 1877. Mysterious death of a lady at Penge. At present, some excitement prevails relative to the sudden death there of a lady named Harriet Staunton and the issue of the official investigation now in progress is awaited with considerable curiosity. The deceased lady was daughter of a clergyman of the Church of England residing at Brentwood in Essex, and her husband, who at one time was a farmer, had more recently acted as an auctioneer's clerk. They had been married for nearly three years, and for some time past had resided in a secluded spot in Cuddam in Kent. As it becomes known that the emaciated skeleton belonging to a rich heiress who has not been seen in years after being taken away by her much younger husband, despite attempts by her mother to block the marriage, interest in the story intensifies. The Mystery The lady in question was heiress to a fortune of £9,000, with farther extensions, it is said, if ever she married and had a male issue. Her maiden name was Margaret Richardson, known as Harriet. Her mother had been a widow, but now married the Reverend John Butterfield, vicar of Great Burstead in Essex. Three years ago, Miss Harriet Richardson was courted by her present husband, but her relatives were adverse to the match. 
On the plea that her daughter was a lady of weak intellect, they appealed to the Lord Chancellor to stop the marriage. The Lord Chancellor, however, decided that Harriet was not of such weak intellect as had been represented, and there was no legal reason why the marriage should not take place. Accordingly, the marriage was solemnized at the Roman Catholic Chapel in Clapham in June 1875. Some estrangement seems to have accordingly taken place between her and her family, and for nearly two years her mother lost all tidings of her daughter's whereabouts. Mrs. Butterfield made one visit to her daughter's home, and then she was banished from seeing her daughter again, with a letter from her daughter stating that she thought she, her mother, had better not come, to prevent any disturbance between herself and her husband, Louis. Louis moved himself and Harriet to a remote location in Kent, and all contact with her daughter was lost for several years. Louis used Harriet's money to buy a farmhouse in Cuddam, a small hamlet in Kent. The house was twenty minutes away from the run-down home of Louis's brother Patrick. Patrick, an unsuccessful artist, was married to Alice's older sister, Elizabeth. The remote farmhouse in which Harriet and Louis move to is very near Louis's brother, Patrick. It's a dilapidated farmhouse. At some point, Harriet is moved to an upper small room in Patrick's house. Patrick is known to have a violent temper. Louis and Patrick plotted together to find a way to get rid of Harriet, simultaneously running correspondence from Louis to Alice, promised Alice that they would soon be together. Harriet had a baby son, but Louis had little interest in the child. He moved Harriet into a small upstairs bedroom in Patrick Staunton's dilapidated house, out of the way from any visits or to be seen. In her small, isolated room, Harriet and the baby had no washing facilities, nor proper bed, only planks set across some trestles. The plan to slowly starve Harriet and her small son was underway. Harriet's clothes were taken from her, and she was forbidden to leave her room. Her expensive gowns and jewellery were eventually picked over by Alice. Patrick Staunton, the poor artist's brother of Louis, had a temper and was considered a domineering man by servants. Harriet was threatened to do as she was told and remain quietly locked in her room. The search for Harriet. Harriet's mother, Mrs. Butterfield, had been desperately attempting to track down her daughter. She was concerned that Harriet may have been placed in an insane asylum or dead. By chance, she bumped into Alice Rhodes at London Bridge Station and noticed that Alice was wearing one of Harriet's favourite brooches. Alice insisted that Harriet had given it to her, but Harriet's mother remained unconvinced. Mrs. Butterfield continued her investigation, trying to track down her daughter. Eventually, the Staunton's charwoman gave her the address of the property in Cuddam in Kent. From the Royal Cornwall Gazette, the 4th of May, 1877, A Mother's Search. At last, a presentiment came over the mother that all was not well with her child, and she began to have a fear lest she had taken refuge in a nunnery or was confined in a lunatic asylum or perhaps immured in a dungeon. A number of places she made inquiries but could gain no tidings of her at all. Mrs. Butterfield travelled to Cuddam and demanded to see her daughter. Louis bluntly refused. 
Mrs. Butterfield eventually returned to London, still having had no glimpse of her daughter. Death of Harriet's Baby With winter, the cold and hunger took its toll on both Harriet and the baby. The baby, approximately one year old, was not much bigger than a newborn infant. It died of malnourishment. There were no mourners at the child's funeral, and the burial ceremony was marked for its extreme cheapness. Five days later, Harriet herself was approaching death. Waiting until she was half conscious, the Staunton took Harriet in an open cart to a suburb of Penge, where she died the next day. From here, the news of the arrival of the human skeleton encased in encrusted filth circulated in the press. From the Royal Cornwall Gazette, 4th of May, 1877. The Skeleton. On the evening of the 12th inst, there was lifted from one of the railway trains at Penge by a gentleman and a lady what appeared to be nothing more than just the living skeleton of a lady. The station master and officials produced a chair to place her in, but even in that state she had to be supported. In this chair she was taken to a house near the station, 34 Forbes Road, and put to bed. It appears that a drawing-room floor had previously been engaged for her. The gentleman accompanying her, having stated to the landlady of the house that he wanted to procure apartments for an invalid lady, for whom he wanted to gain the advice of the best physician he could. He asked to be recommended a doctor, and the next day he accordingly called in a local gentleman, Dr. Longrig, who expressed his surprise at her emaciated condition and gave but little hope of her recovery. Soon after his departure, the unfortunate lady died, and the friends then applied to him for a certificate of death on the ground that deceased had for some time been attended for a gradual wasting away. Every preparation had been made for the funeral, but in the meantime a strange communication had been received by the local police of something like the living skeleton of a lady having been removed from a very secluded place in the country in an open wagonette, and next that a very strange-looking skeleton had just died at 34 Forbes Road. At length the coroner, being urgently asked to hold an inquest, sent an immediate order to stop the funeral. The unfortunate lady's maiden name was then ascertained. Her mother was sent for, and on her coming she recognised in the skeleton lying on the bed the features of her long-lost child. The coroner has stated that the case has assumed a character of serious importance. As investigations begin to take place for a possible remand of the family members, the back story of Harriet's life the last few years begins to come out. Later details. Further important discoveries in connection with the mysterious death of Lord Riviera's niece have just been made by the police engaged in the case and tend to render the circumstances still more inexplicable. During the last few days, active inquiries have been made to ascertain where the deceased lady had been wasting to such a complete skeleton, and if so, whether she had been closely immured against her will. The belief is that a secluded house at Cuddam in Kent, standing in its own grounds and nearly ten miles from any railway station, is the place where she has so lingered. The Medical Evidence The Inquest From the inquest it was revealed that Harriet was half the usual weight for a woman of her size. 
Her body was described as unimaginably filthy with dirt, which had to be scraped off like the bark of a tree. The soles of her feet were caked with grime, her hair was matted and crawling with insects. The trial. All four were remanded. Louis Staunton, his brother, Patrick, Patrick's wife, Elizabeth Staunton, and Louis's mistress, 15-year-old Alice Rhodes. The trial was very well attended, mostly by women from the upper social classes. The Staunton's death fence was that Harriet was an alcoholic who had refused food. They produced their own medical experts who opinioned that Harriet had not died of starvation, but of meningitis, which had been brought on by tuberculosis. From the Birmingham Mail, 19th of September, 1877, the alleged murder at Penge. Today, at the Central Criminal Court before Mr Justice Hawkins and a common jury was commenced a trial of Louis Staunton, 26, Patrick Staunton, Elizabeth Ann Staunton, 28, wife of the latter, and Alice Rhodes, 20, spinster for the willful murder of Harriet Staunton on the 13th of April last. On asserting that all the parties concerned were ready, his lordship ordered the prisoners to be called, and they were placed in the dock. The Attorney General then proceeded to open the case. He said the male prisoners who were brothers and the female prisoners who were sisters were charged with the willful murder of Harriet Staunton, the wife of the prisoner Louis Staunton. There were other counts in the indictment, but this charge evolves them all. It would for the jury to say whether the culpable neglect which eventually caused the death of Mrs. Staunton amounted to murder or manslaughter. The deceased Harriet Staunton was the daughter of a Mrs. Butterfield, wife of clergyman, and she was opposed to the marriage of the daughter with the prisoner Louis Staunton. The Attorney General went on to state that in order to prevent the marriage, proceedings were taken to chancery by the mother of the deceased, but it was proved that the mother was not of unsound mind, and Harriet was married to Louis Staunton the 16th of June, 1875. They lived at number 8 Loughborough Park in Brixton for several months, and November 1876 they removed to Gypsy Hill in Norwood, and ultimately they removed to Little Grey's Farm, Cudham in Kent, where Alice Rose lived with the prisoner Louis Staunton. When asked of the whereabouts of Mrs. Staunton by Mrs. Butterfield, Alice Rose denied that she knew where she was. And December 1876 until April 1877, no one had seen the deceased Harriet Staunton, who had been kept confined to her house in Cudham all that time. Angry correspondence had passed between Mr. and Mrs. Butterfield and Louis Staunton with regard to the latter's wife, who was not allowed to see her mother or any other relative. Afterwards, on the 10th of April, Louis and Mrs. Patrick Staunton took apartments at Penge for a sick lady whom they said they wished to have near a doctor. Evidence would be given by Dr. Longley of Penge that the woman was in a very emaciated condition, that she was in a very dirty state, and that her body was covered with vermin. The post-mortem examination showed that all the organs of the deceased body were sound except one of the lungs. As to the legal responsibility of the husband and those who had charge of the deceased, Harriet, there could be no doubt. She then, referring to her meeting with Alice Rhodes at London Bridge Station and her refusing to tell her where her daughter lived, 
and also of her having found out that Alice Rhodes was living on improper terms with her daughter's husband. When she last attempted to see her daughter, she was pushed out of the house by Louis and Mrs. P. Staunton, and witness next saw the dead body of her daughter in Penge. Mrs. Butterfield stated that her daughter Harriet was very fond of dress, but was of very temperate habits, and always in good health. She confirmed that Harriet was not mentally strong enough to receive much education, and her spelling was always bad. All four defendants were found guilty and sentenced to hang. But days before the execution day, the Stauntons received a reprieve. Surprisingly, Alice Rhodes was given a full pardon and was released. The other three were given sentences of penal servitude. From the Illustrated Police News on the 10th of November, 1877, the Penge Convicts. On Tuesday evening, the governor of Maidstone Jail was informed that Louis Staunton, Patrick Staunton and Elizabeth Staunton were sentenced to penal servitude for life and that a free pardon had been granted to Alice Rhodes. As the governor thought it well that the under-sheriff should make acquainted with Her Majesty's decision before further steps were taken, no intimation was conveyed to the convicts that evening. Since the order of respite was received till last Wednesday, the prisoners were placed under the course of discipline observed in the case of convicts upon whom sentence has not been passed. The indulgence of special diet had been withheld. They had to assume the prisoner's garb and to take exercise with the other prisoners. The male convicts had been removed to the ordinary cells, and Mrs. Patrick Staunton and Alice Rhodes also had cells allotted to them. The aftermath. Three years after sentencing, Patrick Staunton died of consumption. His wife, Elizabeth, was released with little fanfare in 1883, having served six years. Louis Staunton was released in 1897 after having served 20 years. The Harriet Staunton case reverberated for quite some time. The papers are filled with accounts of purposeful starvation, most notably of children. This case from 1884 refers to the Harriet Staunton case known as the Penge Tragedy. From the Derby Daily Telegraph, 6th of October 1884, the alleged starvation of a wife at Grimsby. A man calling himself Charles Frederick Joseph Beaumont Briggs, about 40 years of age, came to reside at Grimsby about last Christmas. He obtained a peddler's certificate to enable him to carry on business of selling patent medicines, etc. His household consisted of himself, his wife, his mother and a daughter of about eight years of age. His wife was the daughter of a veterinary surgeon at Melton Mowbray and he married her about nine years ago. She was some eight years his senior and had a considerable income. On Friday morning, Mrs. Briggs died. An inquest was held on Saturday, when Mary Ann Kitchen, Mrs. Bascom and Mrs. Steer, neighbours of the deceased, Teresa Briggs, gave evidence to the effect that during the last three months of Mrs. Briggs had frequently complained to them that she could not get enough to eat. This, she said, was mainly owing to her husband's mother, who would take the food after meals and lock it up in her own bedroom. Mrs. Steer, said the deceased, Teresa Briggs told her that when at meals the mother-in-law tantalised her so much that she could not eat and had to leave the table. 
the mother-in-law would say to her at the table, You wretch! How can you eat what I and your husband should be eating? And had also said she would starve her out. Each of the witnesses from time to time gave her food, which she ate in a hungry manner. Fanny Willoughby, who keeps a private school at which the deceased's daughter attended, produced a letter from Mrs. Briggs in which she complained of bad treatment from her husband and mother-in-law in reference to whom she wrote, They want to make a Harriet Staunton of me, if you remember that case at Penge. Dr. Jenkinson stated that he was summoned on Monday last. He found Mrs. Briggs paralysed on the left side and almost insensible. Mr. Briggs told him that his wife had for many years suffered from rheumatism in the head, for which she consulted a physician seven or eight years ago, and he had been giving her pills ordered by that physician. By the post-mortem he came to the conclusion that serious apoplexy was the immediate cause of death, which was accelerated by want of proper care and nourishment. The jury returned a verdict in accordance with the medical evidence, and the husband and mother-in-law were committed on the coroner's warrant to Lincoln Assizes on the charge of manslaughter. Both prisoners protested their innocence, and said there was always plenty of food for the deceased if she would have had it. From the Bristol Times and Mirror, the 6th of October, 1884, Starving a Wife to Death A verdict of manslaughter was returned at Grimsby on Saturday against Charles Briggs, a patent medicine vendor, and his mother, Elizabeth Briggs, at the inquest on the former's wife, whom the coroner's jury considered to have died from starvation. It became clear that Teresa's husband and mother benefited exceedingly from her inheritance. Medical testimony comments repeatedly of her considerable emaciated condition, but that there was no sign of any kind of wasting disease that could have caused her emaciation. From the Birmingham Mail, the 22nd of October, 1884, Starving a wife to death. A magisterial investigation into the charge brought against Charles Frederick Joseph Beaumont Briggs and his mother, Elizabeth Briggs, of having willfully caused the death of the male prisoner's wife by starvation was concluded yesterday. The further medical evidence that the immediate cause of death was apoplexy induced by poorness of blood. There was no trace in the body of any wasting disease, and there was certainly nothing to account for the deceased emaciated condition but lack of food. In fact, all the symptoms observed life and the appearances after death were those of chronic starvation. Alfred Pywell, Managing Director for Messrs. Lathan and New, Solicitors of Melton Bonbury, proved that the late Mrs. Briggs received £1,070 on the death of her father, Mr. Rowland, and about eight months before marriage she received £600 under the will of her maternal grandfather, Thomas Henton. She also had a house at Melton worth £300. After marriage, this house was secured by deed to whichever of the husband or wife should survive, and afterwards to the oldest child. Prisoners pleaded not guilty, reserving their defence, and were committed to the Assizes. Within the trial, her husband, Charles Briggs, was found guilty, whilst the mother, Elizabeth Briggs, was acquitted. <laughs> 
From the Aberdeen Evening Express, the 10th of November, 1884, Murder by Starvation. On Saturday, Lord Chief Justice Coleridge, Charles Briggs, chemist, and his mother, Elizabeth Briggs, were indicted for the willful murder by starvation of Teresa Briggs at Clee near Grimsby. Deceased was the wife of the male prisoner. The female prisoner, Elizabeth Briggs, was acquitted. Briggs was convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to 20 years penal servitude. We end this episode with the case from 1888 of a wife starving her older husband to death. The theory at the time was that psychopathy or murderous instinct could be passed along as a, an hereditary predisposition. It is continually noted that the wife in question is cousin to a convicted wife poisoner, Dr. Philip Cross. From the Liverpool Weekly Courier, the 28th of January, 1888. Starving a husband to death. Mrs. Jane Crook, cousin of Dr. Cross, the wife poisoner, was charged at Coachford, County Cork. Petty Sessions on Monday, with having caused the death of her husband by neglect and starvation. After formal evidence, the accused was remanded on bail pending the production of further evidence. The shocking disclosures made at the coroner's inquiry into the death of Mr. Simon Davis Crook had created a great sensation in County Cork and gained for the district of Coachford additional and enviable notoriety. The residence of the Crooks, Dereen House, is only half a mile from Shandy Hall, where Dr. Cross lived. Upon the death of Mr. Crook, Sr., 21 years ago, Dereen House and the lands went by will to his sister, and upon her death ten years back, she demised the property to her son-in-law conditionally, the condition being that her husband, Simon Davis Crook, should be maintained out of it during his lifetime. It was 37 years ago that Mr. Crook first met with Miss Jane Cross, he being then 31 years of age and she was 16. Their courtship lasted 20 years. After her marriage, they lived happily for a few years, during which she and her husband were conspicuous figures at race meetings, regattas, and other places of public amusement. Lately, however, there had been petty quarrels and squabbles. Mr. Crook thus spent the greater part of his time in the village of Coachford. On the fifth of this month, the poor gentleman became so unwell that he could not leave his room, and from that date to Saturday week, when death resulted, he was, according to the medical evidence, systematically neglected and starved. The bedroom in which he died was filthy beyond conception. The bedclothes had not been changed for seven months, and dirt and rubbish covered the floor. On the 14th, the starving man is alleged to have said, in tones of despair, I'm starved. I'm so far gone, I can never recover. I'm left without food. I get nothing but a cup of tea at ten o'clock, and nothing is done for me until Dan McCarthy comes in at night. McCarthy, who is a labourer, used to nightly visit the deceased, and for four days before the latter died, brought him two halfpenny buns, a portion of which he consumed. It is believed that it was he who gave information which led to the arrest of Mrs. Crook. When Mrs. Crook was arrested, she denied the truth of the charge against her, and added she had ample testimony to establish her innocence. An inquest is held to establish of his death 
in a, as a criminal offence. The wife, Jane, declines to attend. From the Cork Weekly, 22nd of January, 1888. The inquest alleged case of starving Mr. Simon Crook. The holding of the inquest was on the suspicion that arose in the district that the deceased had not been properly attended to and had died through neglect. Mr. Crook died on Saturday the 14th inst, and were it not for the interference of the authorities, would have been buried on Monday. This, however, prevented, and Dr. Crowley, the dispensary officer of the district, received instructions to hold a post-mortem examination on the body. This was carried out in due course, and on Thursday morning the body of the deceased was interred, the funeral passing through Coachford as the inquest was being held. Mr. Horgan asked whether there was anybody present on behalf of Mrs. Crook. Head Constable Sterling, who conducted the inquest on behalf of the constabulary, said he was not aware that Mrs. Crook had been informed of the hour. Sergeant Gorman reported, I told her that the inquest would be here, and she said that I had very little to do and that I was not going about manufacturing matters, and it would be much better for me to let her alone. The evidence is produced with emphasis on the utter filth of his room and bed, the lack of food given to him, the lack of interest on the part of his wife, and his emaciated state as attested by the post-mortem. The jury finds his wife, Jane Crook, culpable, a trial is to be put forward. From the Burton Chronicle on the 26th of January, 1888, the alleged case of starving a husband to death. Coroner Horgan of Cork held an inquest at Coachford on Thursday on the body of Mr. Simon Crook, a gentleman who died on Saturday at his residence in the neighbourhood. From the evidence of the servant, it appeared that the deceased had been ill for weeks and that the room he occupied was in a filthy state. A cousin of the deceased proved that on Saturday last he said he was too far gone for nourishment. The deceased was 67 years of age and the owner of the property. He was married to Jane Cross, a cousin to Dr. Philip E. Cross, who was recently executed for poisoning his wife. Dr. Crowley, dispensary officer of the district, proved that death was caused by starvation. Dr. White Macroom corroborated this evidence. The jury found that Mr. Crook had died of starvation owing to the want of medical attention and to the neglect of his wife. This case, as with most cases of starvation, is one of possible manslaughter. The judge outlines the definition of what the jury must consider in order to consider a verdict. From the Cork Weekly News, the 17th of March, 1888. The case against Jane Crook. In connection with the case of Jane Crook, the culpable negligence alleged against her consists in withholding from her husband for a certain period sufficient food and leaving his room and his body and himself in a filthy state. It will be well for you to consider for what period he was bedridden. You must find that his wife has taken charge of him while he was helpless, that he was in her custody and control before you can find her guilty of negligence. If you find that during his illness he had no food to eat if he could, if he was offered other food and declined to have it, and if it could have had medical assistance if so desired it, would on such a state of things appear to me impossible to conclude that there was a case of homicide against Mrs. Crook. The jury retired and after a short time returned and brought a verdict of no bill.
Mrs. Crook was found not to be in any way responsible for the death of her husband and was let go. Legally, his death was from his own choices. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays, Murder by Starvation. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe. Our goal is 1,000 subscribers, and with the fantastic support of our wonderful News of the Times community, we are making great progress towards that goal. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories of a similar theme such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known, grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles. <laughs>